So I'm just going to sort of tell some stories. And the reason is, um, and this gets to a conversation that Margaret and I were just having right before we came into this room, which is um, I'm, I'm increasingly uh, feeling that, that the, the way to understand um, science in complex contexts of use has to be through understanding the contexts of use and that that's done through telling stories. It's not done through measuring or looking for unifying principles. Um, and I think there's certainly things to be understood uh, that connect these stories and I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to uh, um, come up with some ways of, of making some, some generic uh, meso-level statements about things that I think um, are important in terms of, of making use-inspired science useful. Um, but, and maybe this gets to my being a geologist, and I didn't realize this at the time, um, I, certainly the indoctrination um, as a, as a in PhD training and a couple of years as a postdoc didn't, didn't work for me, and I felt like there was something wrong. And I realized in retrospect that that you know, nobody told me that geology was really about narratives and that it was really about, about um, contingent circumstances and it was about how you can be really certain about things when you look back, but when you look into the future, you know, everything is radi radiating out into a million directions. And, and um, you know, particularly in retrospect, there was, no, there was never any discussions about why people believed what it is that they believed and, and what were, what, what we really mean by uncertainty and what we really mean by falsification and replicability. And, and so all those sorts of things have tormented me ever, ever since then. Um, and, uh, but in, in another way, I guess I'm coming back to my roots because I'm more and more thinking that narratives are the way to understand things. So, so mostly I, I, I want to just tell a few um, stories of things that have Im impressed me as, as an important part of, of how to understand how to make use inspired science useful. Um, and mostly these also have to do with really cool people that I've met, a lot of whom have taken big risks to do things differently um, and, or to think differently uh, and have had to work outside the, the sort of the mainstream system, although that's not entirely the case. But let me first start with what's not use inspired, what's not useful use inspired science. Um, so, so this is, you know, in some ways, unfair, but on, in other ways, I think it's actually entirely fair. Um, we've spent 30 billion or so dollars on fundamental climate science that you could say is use inspired since the 1990s. Um, you, you, we can all have our theories about why we haven't made much progress, but certainly CO2 emissions continue to go up. Maybe that's the wrong measure of progress, but that doesn't, you know, but that's the measure that we've decided is kind of the surrogate for everything. So we've learned a lot. Um, and it hasn't had any impact on the way that we've at least framed the problem. And I, you know, I could do the next 50 minutes as a diatribe about this, but I won't. Um, so th I guess the, the first thing I want to just talk a, a little bit about is, is how we decide what's a problem that we can actually intervene with and maybe make, make a difference. Because um, it seems to me that being smart about finding a problem that you can actually have an impact on is maybe part of what it takes to be successful. Uh, so loading the, the, the dice in, in the direction of success. Um, and, and Margaret mentioned my sort of recent in, in, so increasing infatuation with technology. And I'm going to talk a, a bit about technology because, in fact, um, in my quest to try to understand why some things work in the world and some things don't and why sometimes knowledge seems to uh, or why sometimes our ability to solve problems improves and sometimes it seems to just stay remarkably static. You often see a technological s signal in places where, we're, where, where we find that our know-how becomes more effective over time. Um, and I don't know if that, some people find that a depressing uh, conclusion. I found it somewhat liberating, actually, um, as, a, you know, as someone who was, was kind of born and bred to be skeptical of technologies. I'm, I'm, I'm changing, and it's not too late to change. Um, so how do we know what the right problem is? I'm just going to give you a couple examples of, I think, kind of cool, cool instances of figuring out what the right problem is. Um, so one of my favorite scientists is a guy named Brian Tucker, who runs an organization called Geohazards International in California, um, a deserved winner of a MacArthur Prize. And so Brian was a seismologist at, um, at uh, 
Lamont Doherty, I think, in, at Columbia, and um, just decided that as a seismologist, he, wasn't, he didn't have any opportunity to do work to actually protect people from, from earthquakes in, in the places where he was studying earthquakes. So he's been working in third world uh, cities uh, for the last 20 years with geohazards to try to help them increase their um, resilience and, and decrease their exposure to earthquakes. And one of the places um, he's been uh, spending a lot of time is, is Indonesia. And as you all know, a few years ago, there was a devastating um, deep Benio Sound earthquake followed by a more devastating uh, tsunami that killed over a quarter million people in South Asia. Um, and uh, one of the places that was, um, that was uh, somewhat spared uh, in Indonesia was, is um, a city called Padang. And, um, but, but he spent a lot of time looking at that place. And it turns out the big problem with Padang is um, that, that there's only one road out of the coastal plain into the highlands. And um, in, a, in a kind of moment of, of, I think, you know, incredible clarity, simple clarity, uh, it was realized, I don't want to say Brian realized because he's involved in very consultative processes and I'm sure he wouldn't take credit for it, that, that what they really needed was simply a place to walk up to uh, that would get them above the level of, of any conceivable tsunami. And so they're now building elevated parks in the town um, so that if there's a tsunami warning, people can just climb to higher ground. And it's really simple, it's really obvious, and no one had ever thought about it. Um, so, so to me, it's just a great example of, of understanding what the actual problem is. Uh, you could have said, I mean, there's many ways you could have framed the problem. Um, you could have tried to build bigger roads uh, so that more traffic could get out of town, but this was just, I just was struck by its elegance and simplicity. Um, this is a story that the, about the Maasai warriors and vaccines that the president of Rockefeller Foundation used to tell, uh, which is that when they were really interested in, in childhood vaccines, um, and they started the childhood vaccine uh, program for the Maasai, uh, they were informed after a while that they didn't want vaccines for their kids. They wanted vaccines for their goats. And this seemed absurd until it was revealed that we want vaccines for our goats because our kids won't survive and we won't survive either if our goats don't survive. So can we please start with the goats? And this, again, was just a complete reframing of the problem based on an understanding of the context that was not clear from uh, from doing the best science and delivering what seemed to be the most sensible uh, technologies. This is uh, meant to uh, trigger the neuron to tell a story that some of you probably know, anyone who's read Priests and Programmers by Stephen Lansing, people know that book. So it's, it's kind of a hybrid story about how, um, these are Balinese rice terraces, um, about how uh, in the 1970s, uh, advanced um, uh, green revolution varieties of rice were introduced by international aid organizations to, um, uh, in, into Bali and uh, Balinese rice farmers were encouraged to give up the uh, religious based water management practices that they had which only allowed them to plant one, um, uh, one harvest of rice a year and, act and move to three harvests. Uh, and and the, the key part of the, of the um, of the innovation was that they had to change their water management practices to abandon these allegedly, I mean, you can tell where the story's going, right? These allegedly um, antiquated uh, water management practices that were very strongly tied into the authority of the, local, of the local priesthood. And so within a couple of years in Bali, they went to, I think, three harvests a year from one. Uh, productivity ramped up very quickly, and almost immediately they had huge pest infestation problems that actually ended up leading to a decline in productivity. Uh, the so here's a positive story about social scientists. The anthropologists come in, um, they figure out uh, uh, fairly soon that in fact um, all these antiquated water management practices dictated by the priests were in fact pest management practices that had been derived empirically over centuries. Um, and so a nice hybrid was realized, uh, was, was, was achieved with uh, two uh, uh, harvests a year, significant increase in productivity using the new technology, but uh, a, a attending to the water management practices that had been uh, developed empirically for, for uh, centuries. So this was a, a, was a case of, of, trying to un of, of realizing that the problem was not simply one of, of uh, increasing uh, productivity, but it was actually one of contextually sensitive uh, uh, water management. <coughs> 
Uh, this is from Arizona State, uh, where, where my university from the Center for Ubiquitous um, Computing, which wanted to do uh, uh, work to help disabled people um, interact with their, with their uh, immediate uh, surrounding environment. And they were doing um, work on, uh, on readers so that, so that, for example, a, a, a blind person could walk into a library and just see what was around um, through, uh, through imaging and translation. And, um, and they were making a lot of progress and had lots of money doing all sorts of things that seemed sensible to them until they did the obvious thing, which was actually begin to get some um, uh, blind and deaf graduate students into the program. And it turned out, again, something totally un, uh, uh, unintuitive to, a non, uh, to, to, to people with, with, um, uh, with fine uh, vision and hearing, which was, so blind people apparently feel socially disadvantaged because they never get to recognize somebody first in an interaction. Um, so you're walking down the street and, and you have to wait until somebody says hello to you. Um, and, and this, at, at least in the, the students who were initially involved in the project, led them to a completely different type of uh, research. One that was visual recognition, facial recognition um, while one was out in the, in, in the social world. And uh, again, just, just, I just mean it as an example of how, uh, of how problem definition um, is a key uh, attribute to to uh, to doing science to doing use inspired science that's, that's useful because certainly um, uh, the researchers thought they were doing use inspired research before a after all it was to help someone right um, uh, but it was it was a matter of really kind of honing the the problem through understanding the context that made that made the difference um, so um, maybe that's a, a sort of self evident to to you guys um, that that. Appropriate problem definition is a key part of uh, a, a key part of doing usable science, um, and uh, this this aspect may be uh, may be equally accessible. But but it seems to me that there is an excessive focus on making the science really good, and 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 if we're doing uh, science that we hope to be usable um, and and useful, and and um, we're not allowed to ask what would it take for science to be good enough. Um, in other words, is the, is the, when is not good science the obstacle to making good decisions? And when is science that's not usable, even if it's not the most cutting edge, excellent um, uh, state of the art science, uh, all that's necessary? And I think when you begin to ask that question, all sorts of new ways of thinking about science and its organization and its interaction with users begin to, uh, begin to come to the fore. So I want to give just a few um, molecular examples here. These are somewhat extended um, narratives. And again, if you want to interrupt and start having a conversation, I'm op open to it. So, so there, there, I'm going to tell about three what are to me kind of canonical cases. The first is nuclear waste disposal. Uh, the second is, is uh, toxic waste, re reduction of use of toxic waste in materials and processes. And the third is the one everybody knows, which is, is uh, chlorofluorohar chlorofluorocarbons and, um, and uh, ozone, stratospheric ozone depletion. I'm just going to tell a slightly different version of the standard story that you've all heard. So I want to start with, with uh, nuclear waste disposal and uh, observe something that is um, in s sort of in our face, uh, which is that, that there's probably no small area of land that is more studied and more understood on the planet than the Yucca Mountain site in, in Nevada, and we will never likely put uh, nuclear waste there. And the obvious reason that we won't put nuclear waste there is Nevadans simply don't want nuclear waste there. And this is not about rationality, it's not about risk assessment, it's about power politics and, and, uh, and who gets to decide. And, um, and yet if you go back to the sort of original sin, of, of nuclear waste disposal in this country. The sin was that, um, that, that we chose a site and then expected science to make it politically safe. Um, and the idea being that in 1987, when, when Congress settled on Yucca Mountain, and the main reason they settled on that as opposed to a site in the Columbia River Basalts in Washington or in salt domes in Texas had to do with the power of the congressional delegation. Back then, Nevada didn't have the Senate majority leader. Um, they just had reasonably, reasonably uh, modest congressional delega delegation. 
Um, and so Yucca Mountain was settled on. And it's not necessarily a bad site. I mean, you know, my kind of general intuition as a, as a ge geologist and talking to people who work there is that, is that no site's perfect and, and um, you know, you got to put the stuff somewhere and Yucca Mountain would probably be, would probably be okay. But the point is, is that, uh, that it's remained incredibly politically divisive. Uh, enormous amounts of money, not just put into the science, but put into litigating the science, into putting it into the regulation, into regulating, into overseeing it, um, et, et cetera. And, and because we ask science to do something that it's not meant to do, which is, which is to convince people that their, that their views about uh, the, the politics of an issue, that is, they simply didn't want the government ramming down their state's throat, this, this site, was going to be overcome by, by really good science. Um, there's a different experience in Sweden, and it's very, uh, a, a really smart kind of approach to the, to the problem that shows that there's other ways to think about this, and it's not about the science. So um, Sweden started out in the same approach that the US uh, used, uh, identifying a variety of sites, and then on technical using technical criteria, they were going to, they were going to um, narrow them down to a, a single site, and they began to run into the same sorts of pathologies that, that um, we had in the US, which is that basically nobody wanted to, to uh, everyone was going to oppose a site when it, was, when it was selected under those conditions. So they um, switched gears, I think in the maybe late 1980s or early 1990s, and um, instead turned it into a kind of a volunteerist approach, where they selected a number of, I think a half a dozen technically plausible um, uh, municipalities for hosting their waste site, and they said, okay, who, w which of you would like to do it? And the, the logic behind this being that, A, it's different if, you're, if you can offer to do something than if you're told to do it. Uh, B, there are reasons why, there are sort of economic self-interest reasons why it would create jobs for hundreds of thousands of years, right? Uh, or at least, at, at least for the uh, in, indefinite future, uh, it was seen as something that was sort of civic contribution to, a, you know, some, again, this stuff has to be put somewhere. Um, and it changed the kind of playing field uh, so that, um, so that the, the, the issue was seen less as how do you uh, prove to people that a site was safe to how do you demonstrate that the site, site is safe enough that you're willing to have it in your, in your backyard if you s assert to begin with an openness to this possibility. And they were, they were also smart in how they designed it. So, so the, the municipalities that ultimately was selected was going to get a big financial reward, but the ones that were rejected um, would, would get, but that were willing to be in the competition would get an even bigger reward. So there was no, um, there was no incentive to, uh, to skew the results uh, to try to win, even if you weren't, even if uh, you weren't technically as as suitable, and there was also an opt-out clause. So until it, you, you, any municipality that was involved in the competition could opt out at any at any point. So at uh, I think in the early 2000s they had narrowed it to three municipalities. Um, one shortly thereafter did drop out, so it's a horse race between two. They did finally select uh, one, and whether they will put waste there, we will see. But so far, it seems to be a, a process that's worked. And the point is that, that all they need now is good enough science, right? They just need science that's, that, that within the political context is enough to make people feel that the best effort's been done, that there's no uh, unreasonable uh, surprising risks, that the integrity of the process is adequate, all, all the sorts of things that, that didn't make any difference in, in Yucca Mountain. Um, so it was, a, it was a matter of, a, of, of, of creating a political context that put a lot less demand on the science than is often the case when we have these very controversial um, uh, contentious issues where one side uses the science to prove one thing and the other uses it to prove another thing. So trichloroethylene is a, um, is a, a cleaning solvent that, uh, that factories use to clean dirty parts. Um, and it's, uh, it's arguably carcinogenic, although it hasn't actually been um, aggressively uh, regulated by, the, um, by EPA. Uh, but, um, but people who are worried about toxic chemicals in the environment think that, uh, that it shouldn't be in the environment, and, and companies that want to use it and depend on it uh, for, uh, for cleaning parts think that it's important. So um, what I want to tell you about now briefly is uh, a group that I actually spent my sabbat last sabbatical year at because I was really looking for, to, to work with people who, who, um, who, were, who were connecting science to practice in different ways. And it turns out that I think the kind of the coolest group, at least on the, 
occupational health and safety end of things is, is at the University of Massachusetts in Lowell. Um, I, I brought a couple of things here. So this is, this is just a, uh, so it was interesting to actually be in a group of practitioners where I was the like lofty theoretician because I'm usually the person who's closer, closer to practice. And uh, so I spent a year working with them and, 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 and figuring out what it is that they actually do, what their theory of social change is and why it, why it works. Um, and of course they didn't need that, they were being wildly successful. But, but the essence of, of what the UMass Lowell people do is, is and it's, it's, there's, a, there's an institutional story here, there's a cultural story here, there's a political story here. But the essence is, of it is that they've recognized that the, the so, so they're very interested in, in re removing toxic chemicals from, um, uh, from, from the environment. And they've recognized that the kind of the right point of intervention is what they call the, is what they call the, um, uh, the point of production, that is where stuff is made. Uh, because that's, for a number of reasons. One is that's where the most acute exposures to toxic chemicals are. So it's much easier to actually understand what's going on rather than doing population-wide epidemiology. Um, and, uh, and it's also, um, where you can intervene to make a difference in a way that then affects the entire uh, consumer cycle because that's where stuff gets out, gets out into the world. And so what they do is they work with, I should say, the, first they work to get a law passed, the Toxic Use Reduction Act in Massachusetts, which is not a regulatory act. It simply tells, uh, tells companies that they have to list their use of certain chemicals of concern that are, that are published uh, every year. So these aren't chemicals that you can pr necessarily prove are carcinogenic or otherwise, uh, otherwise dangerous to your health, but there's a reason to think that they might be, so you don't get into those battles. You just have to, you have to list how much you use of those chemicals, and you pay a small fee uh, that goes to the UMass Lowell, and they run their Toxic Use Reduction Institute, which is mostly a, a lab. And what's the lab do? Well, they don't do really cutting edge science. In fact, it kind of looks like a high school shop class. What they do is they experiment with alternatives uh, to see whether they can re reproduce the functionality of the chemical they want to replace with something that's less toxic or non-toxic, uh, often water-based. And, and there's a really um, I important insight at the core of what they're doing, which is, is that a lot of those of us who are concerned about how we make, how we make the environment cleaner and, and, and safer um, sort of fail to address the fact that people have organized their ways of life around these current non-sustainable, often dirty and toxic ways of doing business. And they haven't done it, obviously, because they're you know, trying to kill fish or humans. They've done it because they're often trying to make a living. Uh, or they're trying to do something else, like clean shirts, or glue shoes together, uh, or clean parts, or sell products that, that industry needs. And I think the reason that they were able at Lowell to understand this is they didn't, they didn't come out of the, the, the standard public health community. They didn't come out of the environmental science community. A lot of them came out of union organizing and union activism, where they were doing kind of shop floor stuff about worker safety. And so they had an appreciation both for um, the importance of the, of, the, um, of the science and the knowledge, but also the importance of allowing people to maintain their lifestyles and uh, maybe not, their, their ways of life, which are often organized around technologies and around businesses. So the, so the way that the Lowell Center uh, for Sustainable Production and the Toxic Use Reduction Institute work is, is they, they, they look for chemicals of concern for which they think they can offer alternatives that don't ask people to abandon uh, their economic ways of being, even if they might ask them to, to change their practice. And they work with them to help them understand how they might, for example, substitute for TCEs, water-based solvents or ultrasonic cleaning, uh, cleaning um, tools, which they've tested in their laboratory. So it's kind of a funny kind of use-inspired of, of, of use inspired science because they don't get many high-level publications out of it. Um, and, uh, and they don't discover a lot of stuff. Um, it's very hands-on and empirical. It involves a lot of outreach and, and kind of organizational things. So, I mean, just think about how do you organize all the dry cleaners so that they stop using uh, all the incredibly noxious stuff that dry cleaners use? Or, or how, do, how do you get people to, how do you get small shoe factories in, in Vietnam to stop using the very toxic glues that they have? And the best way is to show them an alternative um, that immediately solves what might be obvious health problems um, because companies often know, you know what's dangerous and what isn't even if it's not, even if it's not uh, formally um, uh, regulated. 
and, uh, and to do so in a way that, that allows you to keep uh, running your company, keep making a profit, keep, uh, keep working, et cetera. So, so it's a very, um, it, it, there's a very strong awareness of the system within which they're intervening. Now another aspect of that awareness is knowing that, that, that you know, uncertainty being what it is, just because you're replacing something that you have a pretty good sense is, to is toxic with something uh, that you have a good sense is less toxic doesn't mean that that's not going to prove to be a problem in the end. So, and, you know, another reason that in, in risk debates around toxic chemicals um, it's very difficult to make progress is it's so difficult to, to reduce uncertainty both about the bad sides of things that are being used and about what are the potential impacts of, of um, of not using them. So here, there's, there's an understanding that you can depoliticize these debates if you get people to buy into the notion of making the workplace safer. Uh, if you recognize that technologies in their use are at the core of, of, people's, um, of people's livelihoods. And if you accept that you're not trying to s solve the problem, you're trying to make a step uh, in the right direction. So there's, a, there's, there's certainly a requirement for constant, uh, constant vigilance. And that, I guess we're just not going to have any more. So many of the problems aren't ones in which we can um, provide a solution like that. They really do involve changing the behavior and solving the problems. Well, you know, but well, maybe the question is, is where one wants to put one's, uh, one's efforts. And, um, you know, they're, they're not, sol not going to entirely solve the toxic chemical in the environment problem either, but it's a different way of thinking about how to intervene, um, which is to, is to look for places where you can actually make a difference in the short term by doing something differently, uh, which I don't think is the way that we all, sort of as scientists, tend to think about the problems. We tend to think about how do we characterize the system um, and understand its functioning in ways that allow us to intervene in the system, as opposed to in the social system, uh, where people have organized around it to, to, to you know, pursue their ways of life. So, okay. Um, but I agree, it's not a, you know, it's not a generic, uh, it's not a generic approach to all problems. It's just, it's something that, that uh, for the, for that particular problem, which is reducing toxics in the environment, has had some, some proven, uh, some demonstrable uh, uh, positive effects. Yeah, can I ask a question before you yeah. um, so, so <laughs> I like the story because it seems like it's very tangible. It really gives you, you know, the U.S. law group did this. I presume it's, it's Massachusetts. What's the scaling effect of this? I mean, it, it's 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 local to regional, maybe. How do you take this to a much broader scale? Where where's the transition? To something that's larger. Yeah. I mean, I, I can tell you what they think. I mean, at this point, they're mostly focused on Massachusetts and New England. Um, but uh, but but ultimately. You know, their view is, and this may be too parochial because they do things the way they do, is that we need a national equivalent of the Toxic Use Reduction Act. You know? um, and of course, the politics of that you know, maybe are completely intractable because, because not only would the private sector oppose it, because they oppose all such things, but the enviros would oppose it too because it's, it's non-regulatory. So, um, but, you know, it, it, I, I agree. Is, is it scalable um, in, in a specific notion, in specific elements? Who knows? But I think it's, the, the point is it's a different model of how to think about intervening. But it also makes very great demands on the institutions, okay? So UMass Lowell happened to be a good host place for, for, for Turi and the Lowell Center because it happened to have a president who understood this stuff, who brought in basically all his friends in the late 1980s uh, to, to try to, to create a new approach to, um, uh, to doing public health in, in the workplace, you know? So, and, and again, they've, been, they've, been, uh, uh, they've not been subject to all the same sorts of, of, um, of uh, I shouldn't say that. They, they have been subject to the same kinds of criteria for promotion and advancement, but most of them came in at fairly senior levels, so they were free to do things differently. The question of how you bring junior faculty up through there, um, and now that they have a new president, how you convince a new administration that this is a worthwhile thing, since it doesn't look very university-ish. Um, is a challenge. So, so I mean, your question is exactly right, uh, which is, you know, maybe this was a moment in time for them, but but I still think there's much to be learned from that moment in time. So, so I don't want to take too much time, but I mean, how is that different than sort of a classic old land grant concept of an engaged university? I mean, that's 
it seems to me that one of the Lowell examples are really concrete one, but there is this tradition, and whether you buy that tradition or not, there is this tradition of the engaged university um, that would say that that's the role of, of, of a university. Yeah, the, so the difference is institutional, but I think, so if you want to talk about engaged universities plus experiment stations and, and, um, and ag extension stations, then I think the analogy is, is that the Toxic Use Reduction Institute and the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production are more in the molds of those kind of boundary organizations. You know? um, so no, I think, that's, I think that's right. But it's not just, it, it's not just the, the scientists doing the research. It's also the institutional innovation that allows you to have these, these places that hang outside. You know? And I mean, there is backlash, too, with this new president and a new provost. Uh, the, the rank and file faculty who have always felt like Turi and the Lowell Center got special treatment are not necessarily happy with that. So there is some kind of revenge of the of the of the um, of the status quo that's that that is right now being you know being fought out as we speak. Um, and then the the last example I wanted to talk about with any specificity was was CFCs, and the reason is that um, and this is again is a technology story, and I'm inflicting my technological infatuation on you, but, but I just think the narratives that we tell about CFCs have been, have been either wrong or badly incomplete. And, and there's a, you know, if you look at the literature on the Montreal Protocol on, on uh, ozone depleting substances, you find a really almost funny kind of disciplinary balkanization of interpretations of what happened, right? So if you look in the business, li business literature, it was all about innovation in the, in the private sector. And if you look at the um, if you look at the, the, the science policy literature and if you look at what the scientists like Ralph Cicero, the head of the National Academy, uh, say it was all about the discovery of ozone depleting um, chemicals uh, and, and the importance of science and the discovery of the ozone hole. If you read Richard Benedict's book uh, about, um, about ozone diplomacy, it was all about the diplomatic processes. Uh, if you read um, Karen Litvin's book, which is a kind of you know, science studies version. It was all about the different narratives that were being told and how those changed. But to me, they kind of all beg the question of fine, but, but, but what really happened? And be, because, I mean, in, in, the, in the sort of spirit of the lessons of, of Lowell, what happened was alternatives to CFCs became available. Uh, and those alternatives made it possible uh, for, um, for the chemical industry uh, to get on board uh, regulating the r regulating CFCs, um, and not only that, to see that there were significant profits there. Now that's often portrayed as kind of you know, well that was bad, um, but whether it's bad or not, it's sort of it's it's what it was. In fact, this is a rare case. Maybe, it's certainly rare these days where the U.S. was way out in front of Europe uh, on on regulating uh, CFCs precisely because our industries had alternatives that, th that they had IP on that they were willing to that they were happy to have um, uh, as something that could benefit from a regulation of, of the existing ozone depleting substances. Um, another part of the story that doesn't often get told is that actually the, uh, well, f well first there were agreements in the US through the Clean Air Act in the late 1970s to deplete non-essential uses of, of CFCs, meaning things like spray cans, uh, because again there are alternatives, really kind of prosaic things like roll-on deodorants. Um, but another is that, is that the, 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 the Montreal Protocol on, sub, on ozone depleting substances was initially signed before the ozone hole was discovered. Okay, so this whole idea that you have to have scientific certainty before you can take action um, is, is disproven there in a way that's often not discussed. And the reason it could be signed, in, despite all this uncertainty and significant opposition, including from Europe, again, was a technological alternative that was available to allow people to continue to, uh, to pursue their, their, uh, their ways of, of life uh, without making huge economic sacrifices. We didn't have to stop using refrigerators. We didn't have to stop, stop cleaning uh, semiconductors. And, um, uh, and in fact, uh, it's, been, it's been reasonably successful. Now, another aspect of this relevant to what I was saying about the Lowell Center, of course, is that it turns out that some of the substitutes for CFCs, HCFCs, are, are ex highly uh, potent greenhouse gases. So we have to figure out how to get them out of the, uh, uh, out of the atmosphere as well. So this is, again, it's a never-ending process of eternal vigilance. Uh, but it does seem like we've gotten our, our arms around the ozone depletion process in a way that looks like um, that looks like progress. So 
Um, I just finally want to say something about what makes technology different from science, and this may seem totally obvious. Um, I've, I've now been sort of thinking about this for several years, so I, I forget whether it's really obvious or whether it's not. Um, uh, you can tell me. And, and um, what, t what to me is really impressive about, about certain types of technologies uh, is how they actually allow politics to organize around them, okay? Um, so if you think about something like, a, like a, a vaccine, right, a childhood vaccine, if you think about the constituencies who are organized around childhood vaccinations. So it's schools and it's, and yes, there are wacko, maybe there's some here, sorry. Yes, there are people who oppose vaccines, uh, but I think the, 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 the kind of global benefit that they've delivered to society is completely undeniable and I'll argue about that with anybody. Um, but if you think about the, the constituencies that have organized around it, so parents, schools, insurance companies, doctors, um, public health uh, or organizations, international philanthropy. I mean, these are organizations that in general, if you put them in a room, they'd kill each other. And if you think about sort of how they've interacted with each other around things like healthcare reform, you know, mostly uh, they're, they're a hugely balkanized, very divisive set of, of, of uh, conflicting interests. But when you find something that actually works to solve a problem that people can recognize as a problem, kind of solves the politics in a way that good science can't do, so that's one aspect that, um, that I think is really interesting, important, um, and, and continues to strike me. And, and another has to do with just reliability, right? So, um, so technologies are just their little cause and effect machines, even if they're very complicated, like a, like a, 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 jet, a jet aircraft, right? And I mean, there's something like 10 million commercial landings and takeoffs in this country a year, and on many years, no, you know, no fatal crashes. Um, and so, so, you know, as with the, the vaccine where you have different constituencies organizing around it, something like an airplane, you have, a, you have actually a social organization around that technology, and it might be really dysfunctional, you know, try to find your baggage at national airport. But the technology itself, in part in this case because, you know, the feedbacks from failure are so obvious, is incredibly effectively managed. Um, so that you have these social structures and political structures that grow up to make sure that the technology can continue to function effectively, even as it continues to uh, evolve and become more complex. And you know, this may, may seem very far afield from the sorts of problems that you guys are worried about, and maybe it is. I'm hoping that you'll say, oh yeah, I see what the connection is. I, I, I'm not asserting that there necessarily is one, um, but I do think that it's really important to take technology seriously as a place of intervention in addressing social problems because technology is really different from science in these two, in these two ways. Um, so a couple uh, sort of attempts to, to summarize this and add a few things that I haven't talked about very much but maybe are Im Im implicit. Uh, how to make use inspired science useful. Identifying the right problem is important. And, and by that, I mean a problem that you have a chance of solving. Um, and then that raises the question of what does it actually mean to have a chance of solving something. Uh, partly that means looking for places to intervene um, where you can do something that gives you positive feedbacks uh, so that you know you're making progress. And this has a really kind of galvanizing effect on constituencies that often don't like each other. So vaccine being one example, I think uh, the Lowell Center being um, another. Uh, related is, is, you know, there's only a limited, only to a limited extent can one expect people to embrace changing the way they live their lives. Um, so thinking about ways to intervene that actually allow people to keep doing what they're doing is, it seems to me to be a really um, uh, important way to think about making use, uh, inspired science useful. I didn't talk about this and, and one reason is, is I s expect it's something that you've all fully internalized, which is that the trust among the different constituents in a problem is just really important. It takes years to develop um, and, uh, and without it, um, science is never good enough. You know, so, but with it, um, uh, uncertainty becomes much less of a problem and people are much more willing to take actions just based on information that seems reasonable. And then, and then finally, um, uh, technology is just different, um, and yes, it causes lots of problems, but, but I think if we don't um, take it seriously as a way to leverage progress, then we're missing a huge set of opportunities uh, for intervening positively in, in dealing with our environmental challenges. So I will stop there. Thanks. Thank you.